There we go. Welcome to uh, a Rex pop-up call on Thursday, January 25th, 2018. Our guest is Marty Spiegelman and our, our guest host is Todd Hoskins. They will, I will turn things over to Todd in just one moment. Uh, but first, a little bit of framing. And before that, uh, as is our custom, a poem uh, for the moment, for the call. And uh, today's poem is by David White, one of my favorite poets, uh, and it's titled Sometimes and goes as follows. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of dry leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests, conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Requests to stop what you're doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can, un, that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. Um, we're at a, a very weird juncture in history. Um, who knows, I, I, you know, when 2018 started, I, I was trying to do predictions and figure out what's going on. And everybody's like, you know, hell, given last year, anything could happen this year. And in, there's a couple of ways in which that's actually good, because I think that there's some cracks in the system at this point that are going to allow for um, things to happen that might actually be more productive than what we would have seen in, a, in an alternate universe that was a little bit more normal and not so deranged. Um, so maybe there's more opportunities. Certainly there are conversations that the public is having now that we might never have had, um, had Trump not won the election, for example, um, and were things not progressing the way they are. But um, um, uh, Marty Spiegelman has been uh, one of the two original Rex fellows, has been with Rex from the very, 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 very beginning um, and represents uh, in our um, small world, uh, which is part of the, the larger universe, uh, a perspective that I really treasure, a perspective that honors uh, indigenous traditions, a perspective that is about seeing beyond the sort of current fixed economic realities that most of us are often stuck in and thinking about uh, and trying to figure out um, what is a way ahead that actually honors all those forces that we, that we all too often don't pay enough attention to. Um, Todd Hoskins has likewise been with Rex from the very, very start. Uh, without, without Todd, I'm, I'm unclear what Rex would be and where we'd be going and what we'd be doing. Uh, and it gives me actually a, a ton of pleasure uh, to turn things over to Todd to take us into this conversation at this point. So um, after you. Thank you, Jerry. Well, I have known Marty for uh, between seven and eight years now. Uh, and there has been numerous times in which we've been on the phone having a conversation and we thought, oh, I wish we recorded that. <laughs> so we are thrilled uh, that we have not only a recording of this conversation, but more participants than just the two of us. Um, and Jerry, I loved how you introduced Marty. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate so much about Marty is that um, there's a lightness to her spirit, but there's always depth to the conversation. Uh, and I find that when we dive into a topic, um, that we can dig down deeply and understand what, is, what are the underlying principles at play here? Um, what is happening? How can we understand this? Um, and how can we um, increase our awareness, increase our understanding, so that we can be more powerful in our actions in this world? So this is a public conversation um, regarding a topic that may have seemed a little abstract in the introduction, um, but I think that all of us have experienced it to some degree. The big question of why does movement happen sometimes and other times it doesn't, even when it looks certain to happen? Um, so in order to ground us in some reality here, I, I want to 
to start the conversation with, with actually bringing a tangible example. Um, in my days uh, working in the corporate world, in the startup world, and running a consulting firm, there's often been times when it seemed like an initiative was underway um, and was destined to change the course of the company, sometimes the market, and sometimes more than that. And so often, um, something has stepped in the way that is indescript. It's more than politics. Um, it's more than um, being written off as a bad idea or a poor business proposition. Um, and so, Marty, I would love for you to, to just talk about what's happening um, in movement building when there is no movement. Yeah. <laughs> Um, such an important topic, and thank you all for the beautiful comments you made introducing our conversation here. Um, one of my roles, as I think Todd pointed out, is when we start talking about a particular situation, one of my roles is to drop beneath the surface appearances and start to identify energies like deep ocean currents, real energies that are on the move. And I think one of the things that um, we're going to have to talk about if we look at a big movement that stalls, pick some recent elections or corporate situations, we have to look at, at deeper currents of consciousness. And I talk about this in a lot of different ways. So um, let's I don't know, I just have this image in my head. Let's say we have a chessboard and we see all the pieces and we have our moves planned out. And all of a sudden the pieces on the chessboard kind of by themselves seem to move into another configuration. And we can't make the moves we had planned to make because the whole scene is different. So imagine magnets underneath the pieces on the underside of the chessboard. And there's something down there moving the pieces through this magnetic pull, right? Yeah, and these are powers, it, it, just sort of see if you can drop into the language with me. Don't get to um, try to define it too much. See if you can feel this. These magnets and the deeper poles that we can't see, these are forces of consciousness. And in modern people, our limbic system has an awful lot to do with this. Um, so let me see if it, stop me if I take too big a leap, Todd, so track me in this. So we've got our chessboard, we had everything set up and the, and the pieces move and so we can't make the moves that we planned. Um, let's say we're in that corporate situation and we are all set to make a big change and one or two people who have decision-making power just bring it to a halt even though the day before they had agreed. What I would propose is those people who are in power on day one, their consciousness was resonant with all the decisions that people wanted to make and all the moves people wanted to make. They were in a state of consciousness where their awareness was running in a particular way that allowed resonance so they could say yes, right? But overnight, something that um, they're wired to, something they're attuned to got triggered. We would say in neurophysiology, the limbic system gets triggered. And when that happens, it pulls awareness not to possibility, but to fear and survival and protection. And the minute your awareness is shifted in that way, that's a very powerful magnet in our brains, literally. The minute our awareness is shifted in that way, what happens is meaning changes in our brain, our awareness of meaning changes. So day one, I might say, oh, this move to open our corporate culture is wonderful. It has really good value. It's meaning a good thing to me. If I get afraid of it, I'm probably not even conscious of that, but if I get afraid of it, the meaning shifts. And so the value of that new move shifts to a negative one. And that drives my decision. What happens in our brains is um, some piece of information in a context generates what we call meaning. Our brains assign a value, and based on that, we choose to act or not act. So when we see something moving in a direction and all of a sudden some power stops it, it means that somebody who has enough power has 
change has had a change of meaning in their own consciousness and so they cannot take an action they had agreed to take now um when we're s oh go ahead so yeah. i some of you know that i'm involved in personal growth retreats and uh and helping lead them and one of the things that we talk about during those retreats is that you're going to have an ex experience of expansion while you're here and sometimes within hours and sometimes within days, when you go back home to your normal life, you're going to contract. Um, and what that contraction means is that you're going to doubt the validity of your experience when you were in a state of expansion. You'll start to dismiss it. Um, and you will slowly write it off as that thing that happened back then, rather than some new experience that you had does are we talking about the same thing we're talking about the same thing yeah we're talking about the same thing we are accustomed in modern culture particularly in american culture to uh looking for similarities so if i go to a workshop i'm in a field where everybody is opening and changing and so it feels safe to me so my limbic fear circuit doesn't fire quite so radically and in that field of resonant energies, I feel protected enough to say yes to new ideas and have a new experience. When I go home, I go home to a familiar field that is not so open in general. It's not so open. And I begin to resonate with a more closed field. And all of a sudden, in my brain, I get this signal. That opening thing, whoa, can't do that here. That must have just happened there. Oh, well you know, maybe next year. <laughs> and it has an awful lot to do with our neurophysiology. It really does. And I, I've been saying for many years that if, if we could understand a little bit more about how our brains work, that we could solve a whole lot of problems in a whole lot of places. But yeah, we're talking about the same thing. And we're talking about resonance also. Resonance is an important um, topic we'll try to open up a little bit. I think so Mike is looking to talk, go ahead. So just a little quick addition there uh, to underpin your point. I'm pretty sure that what you've just said is how the executive team at Nokia managed to take a 40% market share of telephone, handheld telephone handsets and make it 3% in about four years. Yeah. They all agreed they were going to do smartphone technology in an executive meeting. Yeah, this is the vision. This is the way ahead. And then they all went away and did nothing about it. Mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that's because the limbic system actually said, oh, you're crazy. You really, you're absolutely crazy. We've been doing this for 10 years. We've made billions of dollars. Keep on doing the same thing. You crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly the same thing. And, and how we are wired in our limbic systems, if we have any power at all out in the world, we will affect other people. The ripple effect is enormous. Just look at our presidential election. But that ripple effect is very short-lived if people are generally jammed into a, let's just say loosely, a smaller kind of consciousness or a more linear consciousness. That open ripple effect is it's short-lived. So we can open to a new idea and we get slammed back into the old idea. Same thing will happen in a meeting where somebody's got a radical, new, beautiful idea and has explained it all. And the first comment you'll get is somebody saying, oh, isn't that like, and they'll say something familiar that's already been done because they can't encompass the new idea. Their limbic system is scrabbling for something familiar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the saying, if you're going to, what is the saying? If you're going to do something Go someplace you've never been before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before, something like that. If we keep allowing ourselves to, uh, to pair new ideas to the already known, the new idea is never going to happen. We have to take a new idea and dive into the unknown, into the unfamiliar 100% in order to get new ideas to really take root and blossom. And the modern consciousness is just not attuned to that. We're so, um, we're living in a world of, scarcity and the scarcity mindset is I need protection and I need to find something familiar and then I'm okay but then I'm not open to a new thing so Marty um, it's one thing to be able to do that internally for ourselves mm -hmm. but how can we help others 
stay in a state of possibility mm -hmm. rather than closing down. Yeah. Well, I have um, been thinking about that a lot uh, because I can only train so many people. Um, the technical answer is we get more and more influencers who are trained in the use of awareness and let that ripple effect uh, play out in the world. But I think just to, to think about, um, I was thinking about like the women's movement, the, the Me Too hashtag and things like that. And I think um, collectivity is, is an answer what's happened with women speaking up against um, abuse and um, abuse of power, etc. What I think what happened was that the, the big symbol of leadership began to appear very weak. And so somebody with enough courage said, I can speak up against that big symbol of leadership and not get knocked down. And then somebody else was at a tipping point and said, literally, me too and me too, and me too, and me too. And pretty soon we had a field of consciousness within our old field of consciousness. And you could walk into that bigger field of resonance and say me too, and not have your limbic system say you were gonna die. Mm -hmm. But there's, what there's occurred, a, yeah. Sorry, there's a similar story here about the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Where, where once people realized that the guards were not going to shoot to kill if you walk through into the West, uh, and a whole series of, of weird things happen in the lead up to it. But once that happens, suddenly, like the, the morning the wall falls at, at 6 a.m. in the morning, there's nobody in the streets. Uh, mm -hmm. At 9 a.m. in the morning, there are one and a half million people lined up at the checkpoints ready to go. Yeah. Be because they've heard that, that the door is going to be open and they can, they can walk through and then it happens. Right. And, and, right. and, and swiftly people go for, and, and the German military and the Russian military don't react by killing everybody, which they could have. Mm -hmm, uh, right. And suddenly we have a shift in consciousness uh, of a you know, very high magnitude. Yeah, yeah. And what I struggle with all the time is that we can point to these uh, spontaneous shifts in consciousness. The Me Too, the Berlin Wall, there's, there's a bunch of others, I'm sure. Um, and I think the question we're all asking is how do we make that happen, so to speak? How can we take an action and keep on that path to make it happen instead of waiting for the spontaneous movements? Yeah. And one of the things I think about is, you know, if I look at the Me Too movement, that symbol of um, killer authority weakened, you know, our, our blonde haired person in the white palace uh, is much weakened these days. And I think that was a big, a big player. But let's look at a, um, at a corporate situation where you're really trying to, to improve corporate culture, but the people in the C-suites are kind of dug in. Maybe instead of going straight at how do we make change um, in the culture, maybe we go a different way and look at the importance of hierarchy to us. Why do we need such rigid hierarchies? What meaning does that have for us? What value does a rigid hierarchy have for us? And I think there must be other windows into the pieces of this puzzle that are worth looking at. Mm -hmm. There's a certain level of consciousness, um, hierarchy starts to dissolve. And the importance of a, a role in a big system is what starts to emerge. Well, partly the dynamics of Me Too and the whole post-Weinstein uh, movement followed a hierarchy in that um, women who had enough status, celebrity status or whatever else, to, to, and, then, and then found the courage to stand up and say, no, this is real, which many people have been saying for a really long time, yeah. were suddenly heard. And one of the things I love about the Time's Up movement is that it's very explicitly um, mm -hmm. women of high celebrity status coming together to protect women of no status. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because they realize, and I think most people realize that this could peter out pretty quickly without having any trickle down effects and the, the maid in the hotel and the waitress in the diner might have no shelter from anybody because they don't have shelter from anybody because they can't lose that job regardless how abusive it might be because they've got kids to feed or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love the solidarity of it, which then, which, which even that gesture creates a different sort of resonant wave in the world of people starting to hear that that opens up new possibilities. So, so it's, it's interesting because 
I think one of the questions here is not only how do you provoke these things, how do you cause these things to become movements or moments, but how do you do this in the face of resistance? How do you do this in the face of people who are trying to sabotage that mm -hmm. moment and keep the status quo quo, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. take, it, take it back to the status quo ante, like, like why can't we just have the Victorian era again? Yeah. Um, so so I, I think that all these things are playing out right in front of us as, as we speak. Yeah. Well, one thing I love is I, I always say that consciousness with a capital C is on the move with us or without us. And it will move through any human being that's even partway open. And so with all this chaos in the world, consciousness has moved through a bunch of really already open people, which is why I think we have these very successful, much more collective movements. And that's a good thing because most people on the planet need to see an example before they'll step in. It's like that old TV commercial, you know, does Mikey like it, right? <laughs> and so now we have some examples thanks to the forces of the universe. And I think what we're looking at is that people of influence, and it doesn't matter what their profession is, they could be physicists, they could be Hollywood actors, it doesn't matter if they have social influence, now is the time for them to step up and uh, create a force field with an idea, create new meaning, which has new value, and, and take the first action to model the actions other people can take. And then they have to stay with it. There's, there's a, um, this principle of continuity that modern people aren't very good at anymore. You know, we want the next glittery thing. Um, but if we can uh, at least instill in our influencers the idea of continuity, that we have to stay with these things, we get the Me Too movement going, it has a peak, it's going to have a trough, it's going to have another peak. And we ought to make it like a good stock chart so it overall has an upward angle. And we don't mind the, the troughs and we love the peaks, but we use the full wavelength of the experience to keep things going. Mm -hmm. So it strikes me that one valuable thing um, for once that we have the awareness that the, um, the closing down, the fear are going to arise, um, that there, there is the potential for us to preempt it by warning those that we are working with, um, you know, over the next couple of days, you may dismiss this. Over the next couple of days, um, you may think that it's not a good idea, uh, that we shouldn't move forward. And I, I just want you to be aware mm -hmm. of this moment when you do think it is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would help. I mean, I, I think um, I think this is really good. I mean, if influencers understand that they can kickstart things and they understand what to keep broadcasting to their audience, then then we will have more people who say yes and can stay with it. And I think the under one underlying thing I think is so important, especially for us in Rex to understand is is this business of how we decide to take an action and not take an action. And it's happening right in our brains. Whatever we're working on or thinking about, there's a context for it. And whatever context our brain is accepting, that creates a meaning. So it could, be, it could mean a good thing for me to speak up. It could mean a, a, a mortally bad thing for me to speak up. What's the meaning being generated in my brain? And there's a value to that. Will I thrive or will I get killed? And if I'm going to thrive, I'll take the action. If I believe I'm going to get killed, then I won't take the action. So this um, meaning, value, action is a really important sequence. It happens in every single human brain. And I think if our influencers understood that, they would be able to guide um, groups of people in making change and staying with it. That, you know, if we start and we say yes today and we're terrified tomorrow, it's just that we've allowed our brains to pick up the old context and we need a reminder of a new context. So that's, um, that may sound kind of general, but I think it's a, a seed for new kinds of collective conversations that we have to really be talking about meaning with people, meaning and positive value and Marty. teach one another to focus on that. Yeah. Who are, who are your favorite sort of meaning and context makers historically? Like who, 
who does oh. this well that, that you've um, admired over time and maybe a little bit of how? Well, that's a good question because I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, I have to think about people that I, um, that I quote a lot. Mm -hmm. Of course, I quote the mountain spirits a lot, but that's a different story. Um, I'm going to say something kind of crazy. I'm, I'm going to um, bring up Einstein for a minute because um, what he would do is to take a little bit of scientific data and put it into the context of life of human life and human experience. And everything he said was based on scientific data, scientific process, but he would put it into the context of human life and therefore create a new meaning that touched everybody. Because that meaning related to every human and all the things we endeavor to do. He talked a lot about his efforts and, and his process in making discoveries. Um, you know, he said, um, that imagination is the most important thing and that the, the, the math and all that, the technical stuff, it comes later. Language comes later. Math comes later. It's the imagination that's first. And that, mm. that has to do actually with his process of making a discovery, uh, working in his physics lab, but it, it touches every single person because he put it in a human context. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be an example that comes to me. I'm sure there are, there are many others. Um, my mind was going to two of the stereotypical people we talk about when it comes to social change, uh, Martin Luther King and, and Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And in, in particular, one of the things that sort of moves me a lot when I think about it is Gandhi's um, spinning his own cloth and wearing um, dhotis that he had made himself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, okay, so that's symbolic. Well, partly what that symbolized was uh, India before the British arrived was self-sufficient for fabric and food. Mm -hmm. India was India was doing just fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. The British made it illegal to own a loom in India because they wanted India to be a raw material source for cotton. All have it shipped to England to the new factories and then have it manufactured into cloth, which mm -hmm. would then be sold back mm -hmm. to India. So they had to debilitate, in fact, destroy India's ability to be self-sufficient. And and so Gandhi's gesture, which seems like a light thing to an Indian person who's just recently experienced all that is a, is a radical thing and a, a physical reset of, mm -hmm. oh right, there's this simple thing that my parents and my ancestors immemorial did that Gandhiji is saying we can all go do again merely by the doing of it in public. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's like a, a really simple gesture in human yeah. life in the present that resets the context for the conversation mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think another thing that's really important is that, that we're kind of too smart for ourselves these days. And we have all these great ideas, right? If we, oh, let's do this and we should do that and they should do the other thing. And we forget about a principle that comes straight from the Andean lineages and it's the principle of fertility. Some, some things might be good ideas, but there's no fertile ground in which to plant the seed. So if I think about corporate America, I wish I could change it this afternoon, but it's not a very fertile ground. The structures are extremely rigid. The, the training of CEOs, et cetera, the C-suite is very rigid. Those uh, people uh, who are in the mold of the C-suite we have these days, it would take a tremendous amount of work to retrain their consciousness. It's not a fertile ground. So I think a fertile ground is entrepreneurship and, and other forms of businesses. So I think we should, first of all, use our intelligence to track fertility and see where we'll get a big bang for our buck if we invest our time in our ideas. And that's, that's really important. Um, I think there is a lot of time and effort invested in places where we don't get multiplicities of return. And then we start to believe that it's too difficult and then we stop. Yeah, so mm -hmm. fertility is part of the context, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So I was on a call this afternoon with some colleagues um, who are putting together a, a, a new service, and near the end of the call, there was this uh, debate on how to sell uh, this new service. 
and essentially it came down to uh, whether approaching organizations with the possibility of having a greater impact in the world or with the fear and shame that if you don't do this, your competitors are going to do it or mm -hmm. you're going to die in this fast changing world. Your business will go flat. <laughs> and it struck me how much selling always goes back to the fear and the shame mm -hmm. as a means of getting people to take action. Will, will organizations take action based upon possibility and not fear? And I may be a little bit cynical about that, but I want to believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let, let's return to neurophysiology for a minute. If, if I say you have to do this and if you don't, you'll die and you'll be broke and you'll be miserable, I'm triggering your limbic fear circuit, which draws all of your awareness into the linear mind. It's a very small part of our brain. And if I get trapped in my linear mind, all I have is wiring that goes from A to B to C. If this, then that. If this, then that. If this, then that. I have no capacity to even consult other peers because my linear mind is not wired collectively or relationally. It's just if this, then that. And I've already been given the message, if this, then that. And that means to me, oh my God, if I don't do this thing, I lose. And my survival is threatened. And I don't think we can underestimate the power of the survival drive in the human organism. It's a tiny part of our brain. It can capture our whole awareness. But if you get a bunch of people who are trapped in that linear causal frame of mind, the power of their consciousness can bring other powers to a screeching halt. Mm. It really can. I think that's what happened in the uh, U.S. election. I really do. There was so much fear and survival demand that certain people got sucked into it. If this, then that. If this guy, then we get the coal industry back. See? <laughs> I mean, we can really be drawn into believing things that are impossible because that's how powerful the limbic fear circuit is. That's how powerful our desire to stay alive is. But it gets distorted really, really easily. Mm. So I think, let's go back to organizations. Yeah, we hope that and dream that they will choose to do good things. But I think what we're looking at is, number one, the cell needs to um, shift. We ought to be more of us, if we can, selling and teaching people to sell, not by threats, obviously, but by multiplicities of benefit. Not only do you benefit, but all these other things benefit and just keep mm -hmm. saying it until it catches on because mm -hmm. that's a collective outward moving um, multiplying process and if you want momentum for change that the multiplicities are what create the momentum if, so if we, I, yeah sorry go ahead go no were, go ahead i'll go on forever uh, <laughs> um if i can draw it a little bit what you were saying a moment ago about the election cycle um my own point of view on this is that uh, Putting, putting the general public into a fear state was completely intentional. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at this moment in history is the only way that Trump and the far right could come into power. Yeah, exactly. Because if, if we were all having a conversation and using scientific evidence and thinking about stuff, rather than just feeling stuff and letting the fear overwhelm us, the, the, the far right wouldn't be in power because they'd lose most of the logical arguments. Yeah. So, so they have to disable facts, truth, mm -hmm. um, safety, all those things. They must create these sort of demon images of what the terrible things that are, are already happening to us and how, mm -hmm. how horrible and untrustworthy everybody is. And, and that has proven, in fact, unfortunately, to be their path to power. And we're seeing this arise around the world. We're seeing other uh, autocrats around the world use fake news strategies to try to disable their press. We're seeing a whole series of things. And, and to, to just extrapolate a little, bit, a little bit more, one of my present worries is that that moment, this moment of fake truth and, and sort of the, the, the falling apart of reason might last 200 years instead of just be a little blip, a little historical blip of a couple of years. 
Yeah. And well, I, don't, I don't think it's going to last 200 years because of things like, uh, like Me Too. Right? Consciousness, if you can get consciousness back to the collective state and everybody's resonating with moving forward, then, then we're golden. But if we don't pay attention, then it's, the, we, the results are disastrous. And I think that the spread of the, of the fear-based um, approach to things that spread around the world, I don't think people really know what they're doing. I don't think very many people understand the physiology of the limbic system. I really don't. I think they're seeing, yeah, that really worked there, so we're going to do it here, and we'll be even a little bit more evil. I don't think they really understand um, what is happening to human consciousness. Um, but if we do, then we're golden. Yeah. <laughs> I fear that they know what they're doing, and they're doing it intentionally, and they're, they're sort of breaking our sort of will to be in the cooperative space on purpose. I don't know that well, neuroscientists the have advised them. Yeah, I don't, the, pardon? Those, yeah those are the outcomes. But, but I, I, think what I'm, I think what I'm saying is that we have a lot more power than we might think. Yeah. I love what you said about, you know, me too is basically a, a form of an antidote to taking us into a different kind of collective consciousness. That's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, the, if we get shoved into the fear mode, we're in a part of our brain that is not wired collectively. It cannot connect to anything else. It can only do what is similar. So if you're afraid, you only see other people who are afraid. You do not see the positive. And that's something that goes on in our brains. And the sooner we get that, the sooner we can break free of it. It strikes me that there's an interesting possibility here, which is that um, as we, we appear to be entering a hockey stick of climate change much faster than, than mm. anybody thought. Yeah. It occurs to me that that would be the kind of very real and and apparent fear around which people might actually congregate and, and a, a genuine threat to mm -hmm. their survival collective survival which can only be solved through collective action so that's very, interesting right? that's very interesting yeah i like that so I, um, we could turn that into a principle um looking for there won't be many but there'll be issues like climate change that are collective period and we can pop back into collectivity that way yeah so i'm wondering if if anyone else on the call has a um a story or situation or case that comes up um as we move into this conversation um recognizing that this is a public forum uh it's recorded and will be posted publicly um, but wanted to make sure that people had the the option of of discussing um, where they see movement stopping or uh, where they see movement completely flowing. Uh, I, I mean, I can. I can pitch in, I guess, by saying that I've been working with a, a, a whole team doing what I do, which is actually almost completely about um, teaching people to how to calm down their limbic system, how to recognize amygdala responses when they're happening, and how to deal with them. And we've been working with an entire team of people who are all focused in an innovation consultancy, and the results there have been great. They've been really, really wonderful, and they have been flying. And each time they run into a, a big kind of, oh, wow, this is actually pretty touchy territory because we're now walking into stuff where we recognize that there could be lots of threats for everybody because they're looking at like completely um, flat and open self-management structures and stuff like that. Extremely difficult new territory. But each time they get, each time they get there, they actually get over it. And I, and I'm pretty sure that one of the main reasons that's happening is because they are, they have actually all become really good at saying, okay, it's time for me to take a five minute time out, take my three deep breaths, float in nowhere space for a couple of minutes, and then come back to what we're discussing. Because I actually, first and foremost, I trust all the people around me. Mm -hmm. so that's been great. That's really cool. 
That's a good story. Yeah. story. No, I, I love what you're doing, Mike. It is priceless. And it's a, such a brilliant example of how training awareness in one way or another, to training awareness to stay with the relational mind, solves all the problems, all of them. Because we are naturally collective. We are naturally striving to succeed. We're not naturally jammed into our limbic fear circuits. And uh, the work that Mike is doing is extraordinary. And, you know, it, it changes the ideas we come up with. We don't have to struggle for ideas or how or why. We just start to experience and act and relate in the world in ways that are innovative and totally beneficial. Mm. Um, Kelly, in, in your work with a consortium, um, can you think of, of sort of moments where either like the executive committee got stuck and got unstuck or some of the case studies that you point to that, that sort of get written up by the consortium um, about the kinds of change that you're bringing? Because there's, there's really nice parallels between uh, the kinds of, of dynamics that the consortium has been working to solve over uh, the many years I've known you guys uh, and the stuff we're talking about here, the stuff that, that's sort of involved in Rex. I am trying to think of a sort of a nice, neat story. Um, two things come to mind. One is that one of the things that we've talked about over the last couple of years, um, one of Greg's favorite, um, what does he call them? I don't remember. It's not important. But um, the, we, like to, we like to poke at the fact that perhaps the hierarchy has outlived its usefulness. Because that makes everybody go, wait, what? In corporate America, how would we function without a hierarchy? And I can see Mike laughing. <laughs> um, and so uh, it has, I've been mulling on this one for the last little bit because I think hierarchies can actually be very helpful, right? There are certain scenarios in which it's really great to be like, oh, that guy's going to have to make the decision. Um, and, and so I am starting a very small movement around, it's actually the patriarchy that's outlived its usefulness. Mm -hmm. And what does that really look like? And how, how do we really dismantle um, things? How do we dismantle it, right? Um, and what is it, what is it replaced with? It, anything? I don't know. So, um, but the other, the other thing that comes to mind, so we do a lot of talking about uh, change management and, and innovation and all these things. And we have a meeting um, once a year that is focused on the consortium itself. So we invite all of our um, sort of most involved members to come and talk about what they want to see, where, where they want the focus of the consortium to be over the next year, what, you know, what kinds of problems are they working on that we can help them with. And this past meeting, um, it, uh, which was in December, early December, was so it was such an interesting and uncomfortable situation for me personally because it's very easy for me to sit in a meeting and listen to people talk about how they're going to affect big change and all these new ideas and totally stay within that relational mind and this was a bunch of people sitting around talking about how we were going to need to change our company and I was like this is horrible. This is terrifying. Like, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't, this is so many things. I have so many things on my list now. Like, and, and we're usually so good about setting context and saying, you know, things are going to be, you know, things will be uncomfortable and that'll be okay. And we're going to do sort of like the, you know, here's the divergent piece of the meeting and then we'll figure out how we're going to do it and come converge again. And we, we skipped that part because we know it all. And it was so, it was horrible. And hilarious, right? And so the, the second day we kind of followed up with like, oh, that's right. That's why I was so painfully uncomfortable because I had completely just thrown everything out that we'd ever talked about in terms of getting into this space. I bet it's hard for our members when we tell them what they should do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All you have to do is like turn everything upside down and shake really hard and it'll all be fine. <laughs> It's totally fine. Oh, it works. Everything falls in the right place. It's really great. <laughs> um, Jerry, it, it brings to mind something that, um, that I talk about a lot with a quote-unquote conscious system. Um, in, a, in an actual conscious system, whether it's a business or a forest, there isn't anything like a, a, a Western idea of a hierarchy. Nothing is actually above anything else. Um, and so in a conscious system, what is important is the, 
the role that each element plays. What is the contribution of each element and what do they need from the system to keep contributing in that way? And that would be a really good reframing for any organization, really. You still have your CEOs and your um, cleaning staff and everybody in between, but every role has a value, which is much bigger than if I put it in a hierarchy. Because if I put it in a hierarchy, value is according to position, to how high off the ground I am. Mm -hmm. And we, for some crazy reason, put more value to the higher person, forgetting that the person would be up there, there would never be everybody underneath them. So I think, um, you know, the Western idea is hierarchy based on position, and that determines value. But if we just take position out of it and, and instead start thinking of role, what is the function and value is assigned by function. And then every, everybody, every part basically has equal value because the whole system couldn't work without all of those pieces functioning properly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, a kind of a, a shift in how we frame things. But if we could find a company willing to work with a team of us to shift their idea of how they operate that way, I think we would see extraordinary. I think Mike yeah. is already doing that, actually. How terrified would they be if the whole lot of us were there, right? It occurred to me when you were saying that, and, and this thought crossed my mind the other day, when we were talking about organizational design. And, um, and I was just thinking, well, hang on a minute. We're talking about hierarchy, we're talking about holacracy, thisocracy, thisocracy, and so on and so forth. But I wonder if actually, in actual point of fact, what we should be doing is looking for the implicit structure which already happens to be there in that organization yeah. of how people actually get stuff done. John Husband, a pretty close to that with his idea of hierarchy, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it doesn't assume that there is no, that no one's got an overview or no one's doing strategy or no one can make decisions. It does assume that there is a, that there is a, a, a kind of almost natural emergent yeah. uh, structure there, which, yeah. which can be dis discerned and cult nurtured. Exactly. I mean, it's like a human body. Everything has its role, but nobody's president, right? Any organism, it operates mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, and so that was, I really like the way you described all that, yeah. Um, two small things. One is the first time I, I started really hearing about these sorts of things. Uh, oops, I just added myself on video again, that's not good. Um, the first time I started hearing about these things was back in the 80s, I, I had uh, a teacher and sort of mentor, Russell Acoff, who talked about lowerarchy. And uh, one of his interesting ideas for how companies might organize themselves is to flip the old pyramidal chart upside down mm -hmm. and to basically said, say, look, all of you who are doing work, you get together in groups to do work, awesome. You get to do all the decisions you want. You have to figure out what other units in the company or in the organization your project is going to touch. And it's your job to go sort things out with them. Tell them what effect it's going to have and that you need their help. And only when they, when you two together can't sort this out, do you go lower in the lowerarchy to somebody who can help you sort it out and make a decision. So the only things that should come to the CEO at the bottom of the lowerarchy are the things that nobody else was able to suss out, argue out, debate, solve by themselves. But everybody at the fingertips has full autonomy to go do stuff. And this was a long time ago. It was a pretty mm -hmm. radical thought back then. I really liked it. Yeah. And then what you were saying also um, describes to me how children used to grow up in community, which means kids are born curious and they just want to figure out what is their role in life? What are they supposed to do? And, you know, we give them graduated responsibilities. First, go get a cup of, of sugar from the neighbors. Next, go tend the goats for the afternoon, all the way up to go organize this event for the community festival or whatever. And in that process, everybody gets to know them. They get to figure out what their special superpowers are and how they fit. What is their best role in society? And you can extrapolate this to borrow from Maladoma Somme and, mm -hmm. you know, the Dagara tribe in West Africa, about which Ma uh, Marty knows much more than mm -hmm. I do. But, you know, in a lot of African traditions, the child is born with a gift for the village. And it's the village's job to bring that gift out and make sure it's manifest, make positive it's manifest. And the child's name is given by the village uh, as, a, as, as a manifestation of that, of that thing they saw that is the child's gift. So it's, it's super, super interesting. 
Uh, but we have so shredded all of these social ties at the local level that kids are no longer able to go do these small things. We're, we're sort of so out of, so dislocated from these ancient relationships that we can't find our way into our optimal role. And then work has replaced the finding your way into the optimal role with hierarchy and job description mm -hmm. and, and status and mm -hmm. barriers. Yeah. And the wisest of companies are the ones like uh, um, Semco, in, in, uh, Semco or even Netflix and uh, Valve and a few others that basically say, come in here, get a desk. We think you're our kind of people and we want you to figure out what we're doing enough that you tell us what your role is going to be. You find your way to the best work. Google operates this way a lot internally, where there's small teams that get together for projects and then disband. And people find their way from project to project. So, and, and lowerarchy, wirearchy, uh, holacracy, whatever, are attempts to take parts of this and formalize it or describe it or put it in the world in a way that more people will use it. And I think a, a critical look at those would be super duper interesting. But, but all of this it doesn't touch enough of the levels of consciousness that you're trying to bring into the conversation, Marty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, sorry. Go. 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 <laughs> well, I was going to say um, that I just want to emphasize this, and I think Mike's examples are really good ones, that we're trying to find the solution before we have fully shifted our consciousness. And it's just not going to happen. <laughs> what needs to happen first is a bunch of influencers who are willing to shift how they use awareness, and then the ideas will show up. I actually That's completely agree with that. That's almost exactly what I was going to say in a different way, strangely enough. <laughs> Go figure. But I was actually going to say, it occurred to me the other day when I was talking to my sister and she was talking about how, you know, from the point of view of environment and sustainability, we have kind of woken up in the Anthropocene. We have suddenly become aware that we are changing the planet around us, which is interesting to me because pretty much at the same time she was talking about that, I've been toying with the idea for a while now that there's a lot of talk about how complex everything's become. We've suddenly discovered complexity and it's like it's a completely new invention whoa you know, everything's complex oh my god look how complex and yet and yet we've been we've been dealing with complexity for like thousands and thousands of years and we do it quite naturally interestingly enough we do it when we drop into daydream daydream is immensely powerful for dealing with this stuff and we just ignore it say so, oh they're daydreaming but but actually what they're probably doing is cracking huge complexity equations Exactly. So yeah, using yeah. that kind of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And really, it's um, in really simple terms, it's uh, training people to get their awareness off themselves and off their ego structure. Because if your awareness is on you and your ego structure and your inner critic, you are glued to your limbic fear circuit. And the, that whole section of the brain is wired causally, if this, then that, and is not wired to the outside world. From that part of your brain, you cannot sense the world around you or make a relationship. You're sunk, right? So we have to get that, our awareness out of that tiny little closet. And that solves the problem. Right there solves the problem. We're not going to know beforehand what it's going to be like. We just have to do it. I think of our guest of so, a couple yes. of years Just ago. Just step off. <laughs> uh, Joost de Bloch joined us a couple of years ago. Um, and to think that a healthcare organization went from mm. six nurses to 15,000 in five years, and still with less than 25 um, people who are in administrative positions, and they're all technical. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I go back to the design of that business so often, not that it's a blueprint for everyone to follow, but the fact that he said, assemble teams of nurses to serve a community and those nurses can care for their clients as best they see fit. And we're not going to build them based upon procedure. We're not going to have a bunch of policy manuals. It's nurses doing what they were born to do, which is to take care of people. 
Um, and the magnetic attraction of that has happened both on the employment side of all the nurses wanting to work there, and then on the patient or client side of people shifting um, to having Birdsorg as their home health care provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great example. Great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, there, there's one of the initial questions was what exactly is momentum? And I think momentum is a little bit of magical energy flow that happens when you let a system be conscious. It's, it's the way Yost and his, his business grew. That's momentum. You let a system start to function the way it naturally does. It creates its own extra internal energy. And that solves another host of problems that we worry about all the time. Mm -hmm. The only problem for the capitalist world that is, is that it solves that problem without generating a large pot of wealth that can be siphoned off into the pockets of a few oh, people. Oh, no, it solves the problem by generating wealth. If it's a it generates really, a very different kind of wealth, exactly. Not necessarily, not necessarily. If, if we could get the, the quote-unquote stock market to be conscious, it would generate that wealth, it would, and it wouldn't yeah. be a bubble. Interesting. So Larry Fink, just uh, from BlackRock Capital, just issued, uh, basically threw down the gauntlet to the markets and said, hey guys, we, we have $6 trillion we invest in you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't start having some kind of social purpose, and he used a little bit of language that, that Tom LaForge has used a lot in Rex, which is, mm -hmm. if you don't try to renew your social license to operate, we're going to cease investing in you. Uh, and, and it was really like, every, I think a lot of people noticed. I don't know how many people are going to wake up to it. Is that one of the kinds of things that needs to happen to get us closer to what we were just talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is one of the things, definitely. But we have to be careful about um, this, this little myth um, in modern consciousness that if we do the right thing, then everything is going to be fine. And mm -hmm. we ask, what what can we do? How can we do it? Why should we do it? And all those questions are pointless. Um, it's actually the state of internal being that generates meaning and value and action that will give us multiplicities of return, including lots of money. Um, if we just decide I am going to do this because it looks more social, that's going to collapse on us. Agreed. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, you've put a whole bunch of interesting things in our chat during the conversation. Did you want to jump in and just comment on, on where we've been? Um, well, actually, the, the one thing that comes to mind is this idea of the limbic system. And the uh, question is, uh, so you can be in a room and set up like a positive resonance, and then you leave the room and whoops, uh, you're out of that context. So how do you invite the triggers of the limbic system into that room? Well, you know, this is, um, this is sort of contextual. It depends on who's gathered and why they're gathered, what the, what the, the attracting um, force of the gathering is in the first place. There's no one principle that can be applied, but, you need one person at least, let's take our general room, you need one person at least who is in what I would call full consciousness, who is not focused on themselves, but is focused on the group and the relationships in the group and a larger purpose for the group. And if that person is skilled in being in that state and conversing from that state, then you'll start to shift. Um, the consciousness of the room. If that person who's so good at all this leaves the room, there's no guarantee that the field will stay because we don't know the state of consciousness of the people who are left in the room. Mm -hmm. It's, there's no, in other words, there's no immediate solution. Here are your three steps. And if everybody did this, it would all be great. We, it's going to take some time to train influencers. It's going to take some time for certain groups of willing people to, um, get what it means to stay in a, a state of full consciousness, to release the attachment to the limbic fear circuit. It, it's, it's not an instantaneous change and there's no immediate guarantees. But if we get enough people working on it, it will change. Um, yeah. One of the amateur things that I try to do toward what Marty just said is, for example, the poem that I read at the start of our calls and meetings. Um, it, poetry, if, if you can kind of come into it 
in a way that that's sort of a bit grounded can change the the, the spirit of a, of a room or a meeting and can make the the, the space beyond the threshold uh, feel different than it was before so sometimes very very small things can make big differences um, when I give when I sort of coach other people in facilitating uh, meetings one of the things I tell them is that every tiny thing you do actually matters a lot so Noticing that somebody seems thirsty or tired and getting them a cup of coffee, picking up the wrapper that's in the corner that the cleaning crew didn't get and putting it in the trash, the little things are noticed and create a, a sort of a part of the spirit of the meeting. And then how you invite and how you convene matter a lot. And yeah. it's not rocket science how to do it better. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it, I think extremely skillful people do it several orders of magnitude better. And that, that's something I aspire to, to someday learn, but, but the simple stuff, the, the basic stuff, isn't that hard to do reasonably well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In really simple terms, uh, in terms of convening a meeting or having those people in the room, what, what we're doing as conveners is, um, creating a space in which um, everybody can be willing to focus on one thing for a little while and removing things that will start what's called a secondary process in the group, removing things from the field that will draw people's awareness away from the purpose of the meeting. Um, so that, that's definitely, it's the beginning. Um, but I think you guys know I'm very interested in finding organizations who would be willing on an organization-wide basis to start to uh, learn how to use awareness organizationally so things begin to change at all levels. And, you know, that's, that's a six-month, year-long project for a company, I think, at least to get going. But, yeah, these little things, that it, we, we don't realize that our presence really makes a difference. We don't realize if we're sitting in a meeting and we're um, not paying attention, we're breaking the field of consciousness. It doesn't take very much. It really doesn't. It's true. The, the, the things that work are, are subtle and the things that break are subtle. Yeah. And I also think that most people don't think they're valuable enough and that's why they don't pay attention in meetings. So here's a, that business of value. Uh, they don't know what they mean to the organization and so they don't understand the value they have or they're not valued because the leaders of the organization don't think in these terms. Um, so again, this business of meaning creates value, um, drives action or not action. Uh, that's really important. I'm not sure we answered a question there, but it was interesting. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Marty. Yeah, my pleasure. And we didn't get to hear Nancy's voice, but we know Nancy was there. Indeed. Sorry, I was a little multitasking. Which I <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Not a fan of. Um, but, uh, but thank you. Yep. I mean, my, I have two thoughts just as you guys are closing off, which I will say this idea that people don't feel worthwhile in a company or they're acknowledged in a company. I will also say I think people look too much to the company to define that for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and part of what we also need to do is the resilience and strength inside people to be able to hold their own. Mm -hmm. uh, worth or, or or path or whatever and when we were hiring for people for the artificial intelligence company that I work with self-awareness was like, the, like a really key element so it was like yes you need aptitude and attitude and ability to collaborate and blah 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 but really it was like who has been through something that they understand who they are so they aren't so shaken and rattled by someone else's opinion ambiguity change etc cetera, etc cetera. so I feel like there's a whole kind of like working inside out piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will also say, I feel like there's right now a big, um, too much emphasis on, <laughs> this is gonna sound oxymoronic, but on the individual, and there aren't systems set up to actually really support that person very well inside these organizations. So incentives mm -hmm. aren't aligned, infrastructure isn't aligned, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that the person feels like they're failing because they're not changing, quote unquote, or able to stick with it, or their own limbic system locks in. And I don't know that we have held them well um, to support that. So somehow this like building resilience internally and building support externally is work that I'm trying to preach more. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank that you. Which, you know, at least the scaffolding until we can get to the conscious world you want, Marty. <laughs> that we all want, that we want to see, you know, on the yeah. planet.
So yeah, exactly. anyway, but thank you yeah. for giving me, it just helps me because I'm doing a lot of speaking and a lot of workshopping in the next few months and it just helps me to have better um, framing for it or vocabulary for it or encouragement for it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, great. And if I could just pop in one comment from Nancy's comments, what she's really addressing is shifting the, um, the juice of an organization to making everybody's role clear and valuing people yes. per their role to the whole. Yes, I totally agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Very cool, thanks Mark. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody. Hi, thank you, Marty. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Marty. My pleasure, thank you. Yeah, thanks, folks. Thanks, Marty. Good to see you, Jerry. Speak soon, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Bye-bye.